Good morning. Hey, another day, another chapter. So, uh, we have um, moved on to where we're ready to move into chapter four. Uh, just a quick re review of where we are. That first chapter was just kind of setting some fundamentals in place. Uh, chapters two and three were where we really got uh, an idea of what kind of are the expectations of the course. Uh, the homework problems, the lecture examples that we saw in chapter two and three, uh, very representative of what sorts of problems you should be able to do um, in the course. Those are the skills that you want to develop. Now we're moving on into what I think of as being uh, kind of the real central portion of the course. Uh, and that is what we consider to be dynamics. And that's bringing together everything that we've learned about kinematics. So everything we've learned about describing motion. Um, what are accelerations? What are velocities? What does it mean for displacement? And now we want to bring it together with forces. So that's what makes it dynamics. So now we're going to be looking at, here's a picture of the space shuttle. Um, there are forces at work here. We've got a force of gravity pulling downwards on the spacecraft. We have a force of thrust pushing the spacecraft forward. Um, so we're going to be looking at uh, force. These are the big items in this chapter. I mean, the title is fine, but what we're really looking at is force. What is force? What, you know, what is that? What units are we going to be using? What is mass? Now, this becomes a bit of a surprise, too, because a lot of times students feel like, well, I, I know what mass is. Mass is kind of, you know, you weigh something and you find out how much mass it has. But it turns out that mass has two distinct properties to it, that it's kind of a mis mystery as to why these two distinct properties both relate to mass. And then what we want to combine that with is acceleration. Now, we looked at acceleration. What we find is uh, if <clears throat> there were one formula we were going to write down for the entire semester and say this is the one formula around which the entire course uh, is it, the entire course is based around the most central formula for the entire course would be this how do we determine the acceleration of an object and an acceleration of an object is determined by finding out how much force we have acting on the object and dividing that through by the mass. That's it. <coughs> that's kind of at the, at the basis, that's kind of at the foundation of pretty much everything we do in chapters four and five. And then beyond that, this is still gonna be the formula that we come back to. Uh, we are gonna be looking at fluids, we come back to formulas like this. We, we're going to be looking at oscillatory motion. We come back to this formula. So everything that we look at comes back, um, almost everything comes back and looks at, at some way based back on this idea. Now what that says is if I've got an object and I've got forces acting on it, uh, the forces could, could uh, cancel out, you know, forces are vector quantities and those uh, force values. So right here, we've got a force of thrust pushing the space shuttle forward. We've got a force of gravity holding it back. What's the net effect of those forces? That's what goes into our overall formula here. And then how much mass do we have? The more mass, um, the, the smaller return we'll get on the force, the smaller the effect of the acceleration. So let's take a look and see how these things are related. Um, here is a list of uh, topics, and uh, I've highlighted force and mass. I put a red sign around weight because weight, weight's a dangerous con. I, 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 I try to stay away from the word weight. Um, in, in teaching in teaching physics, uh, unless we're specifically addressing what is it we've decided to mean by that. It turns out that people mean different things by weight. It's not always completely clear. So let's move on in any case. Let's go ahead. Let's jump in and get started and see 
what this whole uh, realm of physics is all about. I love this picture, love the shopping cart, the watermelons, a uh, person pushing it. And uh, the first thing we're going to start off with is a concept of force. Now, uh, in this picture, there are forces going on. And uh, remember, we talked about this in earlier chapters. We have to be clear about which object are we talking about. Are we talking about the forces acting on the shopping cart? Are we talking about the forces acting on the person? Are the forces... So, first of all, we have to decide which object are we going to isolate and uh, analyze what's going on. So I drew, kind of highlighted the shopping cart. In this picture, I felt like the shopping cart was kind of central as to what's going on. Now that's not the only object. We could have isolated the person, but I thought the shopping cart would be uh, really useful to uh, take a look at. Now what forces do we have acting on the shopping cart? We have down here along the pavement, we have what we might consider a contact force. Whenever we have objects coming in contact with each other, we're just going to refer to that as a contact force. So I've got the uh, shopping cart, specifically the wheels on the shopping cart, in contact with the pavement. Now, the shopping cart's pushing down on the pavement, but the pavement's not what we're isolating here. We're, we're thinking in terms of which forces are having an effect on the shopping cart. So the force on the shopping cart, uh, I'm going to say is this one that I've drawn here, which looks yellow to me. Uh, so I'm going to say here is this contact force due to the pavement. The pavement is pushing upwards on the shopping cart. Now that happens because the pavement has, even if it's concrete, it has a little elasticity to it. So when I set something on a table, or I set something on a desk, or I set something on some concrete, it collapses just a bit. Uh, and there's springiness going on between the atoms and the molecules that make up and any object. Even the most rigid objects have uh, uh, a, a little bit of elasticity to them. And it's that elasticity that's pushing back. See, that concrete is trying to recover its original arrangement of atoms and molecules, but there's this shopping cart that's sitting on top of it. Anyway, so we call this a contact force. Um, specifically, this is referred to as a normal contact force. Now, the categories aren't normal and abnormal. The contact force uh, categories are perpendicular and parallel. And perpendicular to the surface, uh, contact force is required. Uh, re uh, referred to as being normal. So see how that force right there of contact, and actually I should have, I, I, I would have done a better job of writing a contact force at each of the, of the wheels. Uh, it's perpendicular to the concrete. So a surface pushing against another object, another surface, perpendicularly is a normal contact force. Now, um, that's in the upwards direction. What happens in the downwards direction here? Well, I've got a force of gravity. So if it wasn't for gravity, right, we like to say without gravity, everything would just be floating around. Uh, nothing would stick to the planet uh, if it were not for gravity, and that is the case. And so the gravitational force, now I chose to, I chose this nice green color. Uh, for the gravitational force, uh, everything here is experiencing gravity. Each one of the watermelons, the shopping cart, every little piece of every object that we've included in our sample here. So we usually go to what's called a center of mass or a center of gravity, some central location on the object, and uh, we can treat to a good approximation that all the force is being applied sort of centrally on that object. So that's the way gravitation works. So I'm going to have a gravitational force. Now, we're going to have to learn more about the gravitational force and how it's determined. We're also going to have to learn more about contact forces. But So I've got this nice vertical force here, and I've got this gravitational force. Which one of those forces do you think is bigger? Is gravity pulling down bigger, or is the contact force lifting the cart up bigger? 
and it turns out they're the same. Now, how do we know that? Uh, that seems like a remarkable thing to be able to say without going in and doing careful measurements. Well, I know that these two forces are the same magnitude, and that's because there is no acceleration taking place in the vertical direction. If the contact force were bigger than gravity, then that unbalanced effect would create an acceleration of the cart, and the cart would be accelerated upwards. And it's not being accelerated upwards right now. If the gravitational force were larger than the contact force, the object would be pulled uh, downwards. Okay, and there's no acceleration, or it would be accelerating downwards. There's no acceleration in the downwards direction. So the fact that there's no acceleration at all in the vertical direction, the shopping cart's not being accelerated away from the surface, the shopping cart is not accelerating into the surface, that tells me that right at this picture that we've taken, those two forces are balancing out. Okay, so that gives us a way to go in and determine, uh, based on how much mass, actually, what the gravitational force would be, and once we know the gravitational force, we can determine what the contact force would be. Now, it doesn't have to be that they're always balanced. What if we lifted the shopping cart up in the air, and then we let go of it? If we were to lift that shopping cart up in the air and just let go, well, there wouldn't be any contact force, and gravity left to, you know, left to gravity would accelerate the object back to the surface. Okay, the force of gravity would accelerate the object. So the way it works, going back to our formula, is that if there's no net force, if the forces somehow all balance out, and in many cases they do, when forces are all balancing out, there will be no acceleration. When the net overall effect of all the forces cancels out, there won't be an acceleration taking place. And that's what's happening in this picture. Now, let's look at some horizontal forces here. <clears throat> uh, the person is pushing on the cart. Now, we're not showing how the person is doing that. It actually has to do with frictional forces in the shoes right here where the shoes are in contact with the pavement. But uh, the person, the cart, is experiencing a force in the forward direction uh, due to the person. So it's another contact force. The person's hands are in contact with the handle on the cart. Now, if that were the only horizontal force, then we would find that this cart is accelerating forward. Not just moving forward, but actually picking up speed. So, uh, there's a couple of possibilities here. We can't tell from the picture itself. We have to ask, is the shopping cart, is it moving at constant velocity? or is it accelerating? And uh, what's going to determine that is I've got a forward force, uh, which is a contact force, um, due to the person's contact. There's also going to be frictional forces here. So I, I, I've, I, you know, I go shopping at, at grocery stores. I've been shopping at grocery stores. Actually, not so much in the last year. But I've been um, shopping at grocery stores many, many times in my life, and I know that Shopping carts are not frictionless, okay? So there's going to be some force uh, opposing this due to, I don't know, the crazy way the wheels have been put together or, or whatever. So an ideal shopping cart, you just give it a little push and it just goes down the aisle and continues at constant velocity. But uh, in a realistic shopping cart, there's going to be uh, resistance. There's going to be frictional forces opposing. Now, if the person is pushing with forces that enough force that exactly balances the forces of friction, the shopping cart will move at constant velocity. So that's kind of my goal if I'm in a shop and I'm in a store with a shopping cart. I gotta keep pushing enough to offset any frictional forces. If I push harder than the frictional forces are, are, are opposing that, the cart will accelerate. If I push less, the cart will decelerate. And that's it. 
That's chapter 4. Ooh, I was thinking it was going to take more time than that. Actually, there's more detail that we want to look at, but that is a general overview of how <coughs> we're going to start approaching pretty much everything <coughs> in, uh, in these chapters, chapter 4 and chapter 5. Let's go back and look at a little more detail here. So we don't have a shopping cart in this picture. Instead, what we have is... Instead, what we have is a box of olive oil, which uh, that's, that's also pretty useful. And so what we're doing with this is um, we've got the same set of forces, right? We've got the olive oil sitting on a surface, so there's a contact force that the surface is providing to push up on the olive oil, uh, the box. There is a gravitational force pulling down on the olive oil. Uh, we are pulling in this direction. Now that's a tension that we have in, in uh, the string here. And, uh, and then there's frictional forces along the surface. And so let's give all these guys a name. Uh, the gravitational force uh, is going to be uh, I'm going to start there, I guess. It's going to be given by the formula mg. Gravitational forces depend on how large is the gravitational field. Well, we've seen the gravitational field. We know it's 9.80 uh, meters per second squared near the surface of the Earth. And uh, to calculate how much force there is, we multiply by the mass. Now, we haven't talked about mass in detail yet. But the mass, you know, objects with more mass, are they feel heavier. Uh, they're harder to push around. Um, and so something with more mass is going to have a larger gravitational force. But that's it. So uh, as we move through Chapter 4 and Chapter 5, whenever there's a gravitational force, I'm not going to be writing F here. In its place, I'm going to be putting in mg. So mg is going to be my designation for a gravitational force. Now, the book uses weight in some situation. They put a little W there, and again, as I was mentioning, weight's a little tricky because people use weight to mean different things. I'm just going to start with the gravitational force. Saying gravitational force to me is always a reminder that there's a force due to the presence of a planet uh, that is pulling on this object. So this one's going to become mg. Now, the one opposing this, this normal contact force, um, I am going to start writing that as N. I have no idea why I wrote big N here. I always use little n. So if you look at my diagrams, I am going to be using little n for the normal force. The textbook uses capital Fs with subscripts. Uh, for the, you'll get a chance to see the, the kind of the textbook approach here. Anyway, I'm going to go with mg for gravity, little n, I apologize for using a big N here, for normal force. So that's going to become a, a, a little n. Now, for friction, I, for simplicity, I, just, I want one letter, and that is uh, little f. Now, that's another type of contact force. So friction is along the surface. Normal forces are perpendicular to the surface, but both types of forces occur when objects come into contact with each other. <clears throat> so, normal force and friction. And then for tension, tension is going to show up pretty commonly. I'm going to use capital T. So that's, that's the plan. And there's other types of forces that we're going to run into from time to time, but these are kind of the big four. Uh, these are the ones that are going to show up uh, by far the most common in uh, the examples that we look at. Now, again, what we can determine then is, you know, how large is the normal force here compared with the gravitational force? And if that object is not accelerating upwards or downwards, the forces must be balanced out. Uh, similarly, along the horizontal direction, now this one's harder to determine, uh, if the force of tension is larger than the frictional force, the object will accelerate forward. If the tension becomes less than the frictional force, the object will slow down. It will decelerate. Um, and that's all according to that one formula that uh, I wrote in and highlighted on page one. So those are what, you know, those are examples of forces. And that's really where you have to start. 
uh, with this chapter is looking at forces and what are they and how do I identify what forces are acting on an object. Now there's a lot of reading here, I apologize for that. Uh, let's see what we can simplify this down to. Uh, this is kind of something you've probably heard, and that is that it, it actually doesn't require a force to keep something moving. Once we get something moving, it'll just keep moving by itself unless there are forces to slow it down. So when we push on something, you know, if I push on this book, and it pretty quickly slows down and stops, um, that's because there's a frictional force. If I could get a surface here that was completely frictionless and it's maintained its, its level, I could push that book and the book would just keep going at whatever speed I, I release it. Uh, the speed would just stay constant. I mean, you guys maybe have seen this playing air hockey. I don't know if that's still a, a big thing or not. But an air hockey table, uh, the, the pucks, uh, are lifted a little bit off the table by air that's blowing out through the tops. And if you just push one of those pucks a little bit, it just moves at a nice steady speed all the way across. Uh, that's a good demonstration of what um, frictionless would look like. So in, in any case, uh, we don't need a force to keep things moving. Um, so this is referred to as Newton's first law of motion. Um, Okay, so uh, the part that I, I've highlighted, but I've written this in, uh, it requires a force anytime we want to change the velocity of an object. So uh, staying in a, a, a steady state, either at rest or of uniform motion. So here's a good statement, I guess. Every object, any object, will continue either in a state of rest or in a state of constant velocity now, constant velocity requires a straight line. They're going out of their way to be really clear about this. Uh, as long as no forces are acting on the object, the object will just keep moving. Now, it's not only true no force is acting, but as long as no net force acts on it. A net force is the examples we've been looking at, where one of the forces is bigger than the other, and as a result, uh, one force dominates, uh, some kind of a leftover, unbalanced, uncancelled out force will lead to an acceleration in that direction. So it raises the question of uh, net force and we've got to, uh, we got to get good, we got to develop our skills at looking at a situation and determining what the net force will be for that particular situation. That's going to be a big part uh, of solving these problems. Okay, so here's an example. It says that uh, the first law of motion, and you know, uh, categorizing these as first and second and third law, um, that's, that's so if you ever are a contestant on Jeopardy, you'll be able to answer those questions um, in some ways. Uh, it is kind of a useful way to think about uh, these laws of motion. Um, any, anyway, we'll, we'll show kind of an outline of of how to uh, think in terms of this. But the first law is saying that objects will tend to continue with whatever motion they have. They, if they're at rest, they will tend to stay at rest. If they're moving at some velocity, they will tend to continue that velocity in the very same direction at the very same speed. That's if we don't exert forces on them. Or uh, if the forces cancel out so that there's no net force. So what they're asking about are uh, backpacks in a bus. So there's a school bus, um, the driver slams on the brakes, and all the backpacks that were on the floor all slide forward through the bus. What just happened? What force pulled the uh, backpacks uh, that were on the floor of the bus? How did they all slide forward when the bus stopped? So. Uh, here is the bus moving along at a constant speed. Now, if it's moving at a constant velocity, it becomes what we call an inertial reference frame. So, very back, I 
guess the beginning of chapter two maybe, we brought up the idea of a reference frame. It's a coordinate system uh, in which we can uh, treat everything kind of the same as if it's at rest. Well, for any object moving at a constant velocity, uh, that becomes an inertial reference frame. Somebody sitting inside the bus, moving with constant velocity, doesn't really notice that everything feels perfectly normal, right? And as we mentioned, it could be a jet plane. It could be a jet plane flying at, you know, uh, five, six hundred miles an hour, as long as there's no turbulence, uh, as long as we're flying in a straight line, it just feels like you're at rest. So, uh, <clears throat> initially what's happening here is you've got uh, everything inside the bus is moving with that same constant velocity, the backpacks on the floor. Now, when the uh, bus slams on the brake, then they slow down. There's an acceleration that takes place. Well, the bus slows down because there's frictional forces on the tires acting on the bus. But the backpacks don't have a large enough frictional force to stop them. So the backpacks that were moving at velocity v will tend to continue moving with velocity v. And so those backpacks continue to go forward until some kind of a force uh, slows them down and stops them. All right. So uh, when the bus was moving, it was an inertial reference. When it is accelerating, when it's speeding up or slowing down, it's a non-inertial reference frame. It's not moving at constant velocity, and we'll start to see effects within the bus that are a result of the accelerations that's taking place. So uh, the observer outside here, they're in the Earth reference frame watching what's going on, and, and to them it, it makes perfect sense, right? Uh, the observer uh, sees, well, I, I guess they somehow can see the backpacks, but the observer watches the bus and the backpacks go by, and then the bus slows down, the, the backpacks continue to move until there's enough of a force to bring them to a stop. So uh, the laws of motion uh, work uh, in any inertial reference frame. So again, an inertial reference frame has to be one that's uh, moving at a constant velocity. Now that argument becomes a little bit circular because you go, well, how do we know then, you know, if I'm riding in an airplane or I'm riding in a bus or something, how do I know if that's an inertial reference frame? And uh, you know that because when you look around, there are no effects of acceleration that you can observe. Uh, there are no objects that are being pulled along the floor, like in the bus example, when it slams on the brakes. Uh, if you throw something up in the air, it comes right back down into your hand. Um, so anything that happens in that inertial frame behaves the same as if you had something at rest. And the example we used back in chapter two is, well, is the Earth an inertial reference frame? You know, well, for many situations we can treat the Earth at, locally as an inertial reference frame. Uh, its orbital speed is 67,000 miles an hour, but the curvature of the orbit is so small that um, it's roughly a straight line, um, so we don't feel much of an effect from that orbital motion. Um, and so, yeah, the Earth is a very fast-moving, uh, approximately inertial reference system. But notice that anytime we have substantial accelerations, now those are going to include rotations, those are going to be non-inertial systems. So if you're on a rotating platform, a merry-go-round at the park or something, um, things are going to behave funny if you're on that platform while it's rotating. If you throw something up in the air, it doesn't come right back down to where you are. Okay, um, So uh, things change in accelerating uh, reference systems. Okay, so that's kind of the, the foundation of what's going on. Now, uh, we're, we're ready to in introduce this idea of mass and talk a little bit about what we mean by mass. What they're saying here is that, okay, so I'm going to say this is two properties. Property number one, mass is the measure of inertia of an object. So it certainly is related to how much 
stuff the object is made out of. So if you think of things as being made out of atoms and molecules, and those are electrons and protons and neutrons, when we measure the mass of an object, uh, the mass turns out to be kind of a collection of masses of all the stuff that it's made out of. All the electrons, protons, and neutrons. And we find out that the energy, or the, let's not call it an energy field, but mm, kind of, uh, energy fields that are holding everything together uh, also make a contribution to the masses. So the mass includes the inherent mass of all the stuff it's made out of, plus there's additional mass associated with the way that the, the, the stuff is being held together. That actually contributes some also. Um, so anyway, objects have mass. We can get a scale out. We can measure this. We're going to be using units of kilograms to measure this. Mass is not a force. Mass is an inherent property of the object. That object is going to have the same mass wherever you take it. If you <clears throat> lift up a, uh, an object like this, and uh, one way to find out how much inertial mass this object has is let's try and accelerate it. So if I accelerate this book back and forth, I can feel how much resistance there is to the change in motion. And the more resistance we have, that indicates more mass, and vice versa. So now that I've got an object and I know what its mass is, um, the, um, the, the difficulty, the amount of force I need to uh, shift this thing back and forth, speed it up and slow it down, uh, that's going to determine how much mass the object has. Now, if I did the very same thing on the moon, let's say we hop into a, a spacecraft and we travel to the moon, we get out on the moon, uh, how much mass will this book have? And it's going to be the very same. So if I take the book and try and do this, it's going to be just as difficult. It's going to require just as much force to accelerate this object back and forth no matter where I go. If I go to the moon, if I'm in outer space, so if, you know, if I'm in a space station and you know, everybody's floating around, uh, they still have inertial mass. So when you push on something, you can feel the resistance to acceleration that that object has. Same amount of mass. So uh, <clears throat> if you uh, went to the moon, then uh, let's say that you're driving around with your friends and uh, you run out of gas and you have to push the car to the next gasoline station. Well, when you get out and start pushing on the car, you start going, wow, this car has a lot of mass. I didn't realize how much mass this car has because I'm pushing really hard, everybody's pushing really hard, and it's only getting a little bit of acceleration. It must be made out of a lot of stuff. Uh, that's true. Now, if you're on the moon driving around, same thing happens. You run out of gasoline. It's going to be just as hard to push it to the next station, to the next gas station. Okay, so pushing on that car and getting it moving is going to be just as difficult because it has just as much mass. It's going to require just as much force to uh, bring that car up to speed. Once you get it up to speed, the car, you know, the, the bearings are, are lubricated pretty well, and if it's level, then the car can be pushed along with not as much, but that first bringing it up to speed, the, the, the time when you're uh, creating that acceleration, that's, you know, that's where you uh, experience a lot of mass. So at the bottom here, it says if you go to the moon, uh, the gravitational field <clears throat> is only one-sixth as, as, as large now, that doesn't affect the inertial mass. The inertial mass is the same in any case, but if the field is only one-sixth as much, it's going to be easier to lift. So I can lift, maybe I can lift my car and just carry it to the next gas station, uh, but actually, you know, still accelerating the car is going to require uh, the same amount of force, accelerating along the surface, if it's the same mass. Um, here is the second law of motion. Now, the second law of motion is the one we wrote down and uh, we 
talked about how important this is and we highlighted it and said this is just central and foundational to kind of everything we're going to be doing in the course. This uh, formula is going to get used over and over and over. Um, <clears throat> thus, uh, this is actually designated as Newton's second law, <coughs> saying that the acceleration depends on the net force uh, acting on an object divided through by its mass. Okay, so more mass means we're going to get less acceleration uh, if we push with the same amount of force. So the same amount of force is not going to have as much of an effect on a, a, an automobile that might be a thousand kilograms uh, compared with a textbook that is, you know, three or four kilograms, something like that. Now, uh, we've drawn diagrams, those early diagrams when we were looking at forces. Notice they had vertical forces and there were horizontal forces and forces could be diagonally placed. So how do we bring forces together if they're in different directions? Forces are definitely vectors. So forces are vector quantities and uh, we can work in terms of the x components of the forces and in terms of y components of forces. And the acceleration in the x is specifically related to the force in the x direction and the acceleration in the y direction will be specifically related to uh, forces in the y direction. Okay, so we can divide those up into x, y, and z components um, the same way we did with velocities and with, with acceleration. We've already seen acceleration in different components. Now the force unit, the unit, the unit that we use to designate forces in the uh, International System of Units is called the Newton, uh, and that's a capital N. So that's what the capital N is. The capital N is the unit Newton, uh, and that's a unit of force. So just a quick comparison here. Uh, in standard units, the international system, uh, the kilogram is the standard unit of mass, and uh, the standard unit of force is a newton. Now, a newton is not a standalone unit. Uh, a newton, if you look at the formulas here, a newton actually is made up of a kilogram times a meter divided by seconds squared. Now, that this is where things, for me, when I was first learning this, were a little weird. I thought, well, a force is a force. Uh, a force doesn't really, does a force really depend on time units or on length units? Well, it, it does. And so what we've got here is um, if we're going to have units of uh, newtons here, we need to have units of newtons where when we divide through by kilograms, we are going to get meters per second squared. And that tells us how the units are going to be related. Now, there, there's another set of kind of standard international units that we work with, and that's called the CGS system. And there for mass, they use grams, and the force here is in dynes, and the accelerations are, uh, standard units are centimeters uh, per second squared. So um, if you've heard, I want to say on some of the, the movies about space travel, and uh, if you're looking at documentaries about, uh, uh, you'll hear the engineers talking about uh, dynes. Um, how many dimes of force are acting. Now, the British system, which is supposed to be, it's supposed to be uh, we're supposed to have gotten beyond that so that we're all on the same page. Uh, but, you know, we, we tend to use the United States, we tend to use, continue to use the British system. So for forces, we're using a pound. Now, that's kind of interesting because when we're measuring things out here, uh, we don't measure them according, strictly speaking, to their mass. What we do is we work in terms of how much force they create when they're placed in a gravitational field. And so that says that uh, there, there is a conversion between pound and newton, which is fixed, but the relationship between kilograms and pounds uh, is, is not necessarily fixed. That's going to depend on what the gravitational fields are. Okay, so anyway, 
Uh, the British unit for mass, now this is a little hilarious, is called the slug. You go, really? I've never heard of the slug. I've never seen the slug used anywhere. Uh, when I go shopping and I pick items up, they're listed in pounds and they're listed in kilograms. I have yet to see a slug listed on the package. And so um, let's take a quick look at how that's uh, defined, how some of these units are defined. Um, maybe, maybe we'll come back to this. Okay, so uh, actually let's move on and take a look at something uh, more important. And that is coming back to one of these diagrams. Now we've looked at a couple of these already. This could be the shopping cart, right? Or this could be the uh, box of olive oil at the store that we were uh, measuring. So here's an object. Let's say that it's moving at some speed. Maybe there's an acceleration going on. Maybe there is, maybe there's not. Here are the forces. Let's say we're pulling on this. With, so I've got something attached to this object, and I'm pulling on it. Um, that's exerting a force in the forward direction here. There's a frictional force along the surface opposing that, uh, a force in the opposite direction. The mg, remember, that's gravity. So the gravitational force is going to be m times g, and that's downwards. And then there's a contact all along the surface, and we'll bring that all together and call that the normal force, and that's upwards. So um, for this particular situation, what we can say is, is this. Um, let's see. Back in, I think it was chapter two, we said, let's think about two categories of motion. Uh, this is going to be important for us to think about. One of the categories of motion is what we would call constant velocity. Now remember, constant velocity has some requirements to it. If I'm going to travel at constant velocity, I have to be going in a straight line, and I have to be moving at exactly the same speed at every instant. So we do have examples of objects moving at, at pretty close to constant velocity. So that's an important category of motion. Now, if an object is moving at constant velocity, what Newton's laws of motion tell us is for an object moving at constant velocity, the forces all cancel out. So there's no net force. What would it take for that object to be moving with constant velocity. Now, uh, if the acceleration is going to be zero, that would say that F would have to match the same number of newtons. If the friction is, say, 40 newtons of friction, then I've got to have 40 newtons of force pulling the object forward. If it's less than that, it'll slow down. If it's more than 40, it'll speed up in that direction. So in order to maintain a constant velocity, the forces have to cancel out. Now another possibility would be to have the object at rest. Uh, if we have this at rest, the friction force goes away and we don't have to pull on it at all. So if we just want it to stay at rest, uh, we just set it on a table and um, it will just stay there. All right. Uh, now that's in the x direction. What about the y direction? What's going on in the y? Uh, and again, if we want to have no accelerations taking place, then n would have to be equal to mg. Now, notice that on these diagrams, on this chart that I put together here, the arrows go both ways. So it says that any time in a problem, I'm thinking ahead towards homework and midterms and final exams, uh, anytime in a problem, if I'm given an object that I know is moving at constant velocity, well that says that the acceleration is zero. So these two are interchangeable. If they say the acceleration is zero, that means the velocity is constant. One of the possibilities for constant velocity would be at rest, but it's not the only one. So. Uh, Constant velocity implies all the forces cancel out. There's no net force. Now, we could start at this end of the chart and say, what happens if I am given a problem 
where all the forces cancel out. Well, if all the forces cancel out, and there's no net force, then the motion must be acceleration is zero, otherwise known as constant velocity. Okay, so those things all go together. If one occurs, it must be that it, but the other thing is taking place at the same time. So that's good to know. Now, what happens if we do have an acceleration? Acceleration is not equal to zero. Well, the only way the acceleration could be not equal to zero, according to uh, the laws, Newton's laws of motion, is if uh, some of these forces don't balance out. If big F, if this object's being pulled with a larger force than the opposing frictional force, the object's going to pick up speed. Okay. Bottom line, that's it. That's how motion is related to forces. So we have constant velocity. The only other category would be uh, accelerated motion. Okay, If it's not moving with constant velocity, then it's accelerating in some ways. And remember, at rest is a subcategory of constant velocity. Okay, that's it. So if the velocity is not constant, there must be a net force. Now, the formula gets written this way. So we say that um, here is the net force. We divide through by the mass to find out how much acceleration we will have. These are vector formulas, which means I can rewrite that as an x and a y formula. So hidden inside that vector formula are actually three formulas, one for the x direction, one for the y, and one for the z. All right. So, uh, and that, that's it. That's, that's kind of the whole story. Um, let's see how to apply that. So here's, um, here's the example with the slugs. So let's take a look at this. Let's say that we have a mass, and it's one kilogram, and uh, what we're going to do is have this thing accelerate at one meter per second. So if I have something with one kilogram uh, accelerating at one meter per second, that is going to require a force of one newton. That's how newtons, kilograms, and meters per second are all related. Now, let's move over and do the whole thing in British. Now, uh, the slug, it turns out, is equivalent to 14.6 kilograms. That's a lot of kilograms, right? So, uh, if I lift a kilogram, the force I need to support a kilogram is, um, is a couple of pounds of force to hold up a kilogram of something. So, that means that a slug, holding up a slug of mass, uh, would be like 30, 30 pounds or something. So just one slug by itself, how did that come about? Well, a mass of one slug is the amount of mass that would move at an acceleration, would accelerate, at a rate of one foot per second per second uh, if there is a pound of force. So if you take a look at all the conversions going on here, um, one slug is the equivalent of 14.6 kilograms. One foot per second is uh, 0 0.305 uh, meters per second. And when we multiply these numbers together, we get uh, 4.45 newtons, which is the same thing as one pound. So it, it has to do, the way the slug is defined, it has to do with how feet are defined versus meters and how pounds are defined versus newtons. Um, and, and so that's, that's it. That's how slugs are defined. Uh, I've, never, I've never seen a slug listed uh, as the mass of, of anything, but uh, that's the official British unit. All right, let's take a look at uh, the force needed to accelerate <clears throat> a car. <clears throat> I don't think they needed to say a fast car. Uh, just a force needed to accelerate a car. Uh, estimate the force needed to accelerate a 1,000 kilogram car. Ooh, that could be my 2,400 Civic. 
Um, so a thousand kilograms, and we want to accelerate this at one half of g. Now, uh, the author of our book likes to uh, list accelerations in terms of gravitational acceleration, and that's okay. So uh, accelerating at one half g would um, would be 4.9 meters per second per second. Okay, one half of the gravitational field value. Uh, now where that is useful is if the car is accelerating at g, you know that if you're accelerating, you feel heavy in the backwards direction. It's like the seat is, has to push extra hard on you to accelerate you, and, and that's what's going on. Uh, so if you're accelerating a half, at one half of g, you feel the equivalent of half of your weight, but it's in the backwards direction. You feel um, heavier. There's more of a contact force. Uh, so we're going to look at a 100 kilogram car. We're going to compare it with a 200 gram apple. Uh, how much uh, force would it require to uh, accelerate those objects? And then down here, it says they, they've got two examples on the same page. How much force would I need to stop a car? <clears throat> so we want to take our, this time it's a 1,500 kilogram car. We want to bring it from 100 kilo, uh, kilometers per hour uh, down to zero. And we want to be able to do that over a distance of 55 meters. So let's take a look at what these problems. The first one first. Uh, the first problem was just saying, hey, I got a car, it's 1,000 kilograms. I want it to, uh, and here's the apple, and the mass here was uh, 200 grams, 0 0.200 kilograms. Uh, the acceleration that we wanted was 4.9 meters per second squared. Again, this is one half of the gravitational acceleration. For whatever reason, that's how uh, the information was provided. If I'm going to take a 1,000 kilogram object and accelerate it, at 4.9 meters per second squared, I am going to need a force of 4,900 newtons. So notice what happened here. The units of kilograms multiplied by meter divided by second squared, that particular combination of units is a newton. That is a newton, a force. And so uh, the way these units are defined, so that's going to be uh, 4,900 uh, newtons that we are going to need. Now, uh, what about the apple? <laughs> You're going, hey, that's a lot less mass. Well, if it's only 0.2 kilograms accelerated to this speed, I don't need, I barely need a newton, okay, to be able to accelerate that apple versus 4,900 newtons. Now, uh, 10,000 newtons is considered a ton of force. And so this is, this is a line that's half a ton of force I would need to accelerate the car at that rate. So that's how these formulas work. And I guess the formulas are up here. I should refer to them. I've been writing this as acceleration equals F over M. And the reason I do that is because I feel like the force is creating the acceleration. This is the result. When we exert a force on something, uh, we end up with an acceleration and the amount of acceleration is given by the force divided by mass. Now we, of course, can flip around these equations. I could write it by saying, how much force would I need in order to accelerate an object with a mass of m? And that's how we've used it in this example. So as the mass goes up, I'm going to need more and more force to be able to accelerate that object at, at some value of, uh, of acceleration. All right, here's that second example on that same page, and this was stopping the car. So this is a good example of bringing in the stuff we looked at in Chapter 2. So let's bring in some kinematic formulas uh, involving um, constant uh, acceleration. So what I want to do is I want to have this car slow down and stop. I want it to start out with some velocity, v naught and I want it to end up with a velocity of zero, and I want that to happen over a distance of 55 meters. And so I'm, I'm looking at my formulas for constant acceleration. 
uh, this formula relates distance and speeds. That's the one I chose to use. There was no question here about timing. They didn't say how much time is this going to take, so I ignored the formulas with time. Uh, <clears throat> let's see, this has got to be zero. This is going to be, what was the initial speed? So they said a, a, a 1,500 kilogram car at 100 kilometers per hour. Now 100 kilometers per hour, that's 100,000 meters divided by 3,600 seconds. That's like 28 meters per second. So 28 meters per second, the car is going. That's like 60 miles an hour, 60, 65, something like that. So I got a car. It's 1,500 kilograms. It's a little heavier than my uh, 2004 Honda Civic. Um, so um, probably, maybe not. Maybe it's, it's anyway, uh, this is going to be 27.8 meters per second. I've got to bring it down from that speed. Now, I know this. I know that the force I'm going to need depends on how much mass the object has and how much acceleration I'm expecting. So if I want a larger acceleration, that's going to take more force. If I've got more mass, that's going to take more force. So that's going to determine how much force we need to bring this car to a stop. Now, plugging in the numbers here, I put in the zero, uh, I solved for acceleration, the four, oh, here it is. Uh, the, the V is still here, and then I put the zero in here. Here is the starting speed, uh, and here is two times the displacement. I need an acceleration of negative 7.0 meters per second per second. That's the acceleration I'm going to need. Uh, I say this refers back to chapter 3, but maybe more precisely, it, it really uh, uh, goes back to chapter 2. So we're looking at chapter uh, 2 formulas now where we first introduced constant uh, acceleration formulas. So that's how much acceleration I need. So let's calculate how much force. I've got an object. The object has 1,500 kilograms of mass. And I would like it to accelerate, uh, specifically decelerate in this case, at a rate of 7.01 meters per second per second. That is going to require uh, 10,520 newtons in the negative direction. Uh, so that diagram down at the bottom, velocity is in the forward direction the whole time. Even when I'm stopping, the velocity is still going forward. The acceleration is opposite to that, and the force, specifically the force that's going to slow us down, it needs to be in the same direction as the acceleration. Forces and accelerations are always going to point in the same direction uh, within classical physics. That's how it works. Um, and that 10,000 newtons, that's like a ton of force. And I'm going to need that. Uh, specifically, what force is it that's going to bring my car to a stop? And it's going to be frictional forces between the tires and the pavement. So if the roadway's icy, good luck. Right? If I don't have the frictional forces, the acceleration is not going to happen. So forces are required to create an acceleration, or a deceleration in this case. And uh, if we don't have the forces present, uh, we, we can't have the acceleration take place. Okay, uh, this is probably a pretty good place to stop for the day, um, maybe I'll do that. I, I think we're just a little, well, let's go ahead. What I'll do is this. Let me look at the next couple slides. Uh, and then starting uh, next class when we meet, um, for next class, we'll, we'll come back and start from this slide right here. So let's remember. Uh, so we did the first law. The first law was saying uh, if there's no forces, objects just continue to travel in a straight line at the same speed, something we call constant velocity. Now the second law <clears throat> said that if there are forces, those forces will create accelerations. Now the first law and the second law, are, they're kind of part of the same package because that one formula, which I don't know how far back we have to go to find it, 
right there. Uh, this one formula right here, the one that I started off the very, the, the very front page of the chapter, uh, wrote that in and highlighted it, uh, <clears throat> that includes the first and second laws. Everything in the first and uh, er, the, everything we state about the first and second laws is in that formula. So that's the first and second law combined. There's a third law of motion that Newton came up with, and what Newton found, or what Newton uh, suggested is going on, is that forces always come in pairs. Now, what that says is that uh, forces could be thought of as a pair of forces, or a force pair, or an interaction. If I push down on a table, if I push down on something, uh, not when I make contact, my hand is pushing down on the table, but at the same time the table is pushing up on my hand. There's no way around it. I can't sneak up on the table when it's not looking and push on it without it pushing back. And <clears throat> the amount that the table pushes back is exactly the same as the amount that I push on the table. And it happens at the same time. It's simultaneous. So there's not a delay. Uh, sometimes the third law says that for every action there's a reaction. I don't care for that statement because to me it sounds kind of like there's a delay. Kind of like when I push on the table, the table wakes up and goes, oh wait a minute, I've got to push back. I've got to react to this. Uh, so when contact is made, <clears throat> A pair of forces get set up between the two objects. The direction of those forces will be exactly opposite, and the magnitudes will be the same. So if I push on a, a, a table with 20 newtons of force downwards, the table pushes up on my hand with a force uh, of 20 newtons upwards. Now, why don't those forces cancel out, because they're equal in opposite direction, and they're acting on different objects. So if I push on an object, if I push down on the table, uh, the table experiences a 20 Newton force downward, but the table has other forces acting on it. My hand is not the only object. So if we isolate the table, the 20 Newtons force from my hand will show up in the force diagram. Now, what about the other half of that? What about the table pushing up on my hand well, that affects me. So when I draw a diagram of myself and all the forces acting on me, only the upwards 20 Newton force is included, not the downwards one. The downwards one is acting on the table. So uh, that says, and this, you know, the picture here is probably easier to see. So when I look at this pair of forces uh, taking place, the hand experiences the force in one direction, but the table's going to experience a force in the opposite direction, and they're two distinct objects. Uh, it's not that both of these forces are acting on the hand. If both of those forces were acting on the hand, they'd cancel out. But they're acting on two different objects. Now, how reliable is the third law? And uh, we definitely, the third law applies for contact forces. Does it apply for gravity? And Newton suggested that it does. We now have a better understanding of gravity and realize that there is a time delay with gravity. Gravity is not instantaneous. Uh, the moon does not instantaneously feel the gravitational effect of the Earth. Uh, if the Earth were suddenly to disappear, the moon would continue to feel the Earth's gravitation for a short period of time. Uh, gravitational effects propagate at the speed of light uh, the sun, for example, uh, it requires light to travel about eight minutes from the sun to the earth. Well, it turns out that gravitational effects apply, you know, the time delay effect happens here too. The gravity we're currently experiencing from the sun was due to the present location of the sun from eight minutes ago. If the sun has moved, we won't know about that <clears throat> for eight minutes. And the gravitational effects won't reach us for eight minutes. So that's kind of interesting. So the third law turns out to be a really, really good approximation that we can work from. But it's not quite true for gravity. Uh, it's not quite true for electric forces. 
uh, and magnetic forces. So it turns out that gravity, electric forces, magnetic forces, there is uh, this time delay effect. Uh, these long range distant forces uh, have, have a bit of a delay. So we'll start right from here, uh, next class. Uh, I'm going to stop right there. If you guys have any questions, if so, stop by office hours. Are you guys staying caught up on everything? Make sure that you're, you're, you're currently, you know, you should be all the way through chapters 1, 2, and 3, uh, ready to really dive in uh, to chapter 4. So, again, make sure you're staying caught up. Uh, stop by office hours with whatever questions you have.